the Farm Excellence Programme at HDB really is a project set up to demonstrate the value of implementing best practice on farms. We have uh, nine strategic and monitor farms located across England. It's a four-year programme where farmers will be able to learn from industry experts, learn about the challenges and opportunities on those host farms and hopefully go away with a lot of knowledge that they can implement on their own farms. Hi there, we're at um, Scatch Hill Farm just outside Bude in Cornwall today uh, for our Monitor Farm launch. We decided to apply so we really felt that we um, would hopefully be able to add something and be able to encourage other people to, to become engaged with AHDB. On-farm events are so important because they provide the opportunity to come and see, to feel and sometimes even taste um, the information that we're talking about. We hear from lots of different industry experts, um, farmers, consultants and the farmers get the opportunity to talk about what they've learnt over a cup of coffee or often a bacon sandwich. For us, certainly I think they're really important. You get to, to go and visit other people's farms, see what they're trying, see how they're able to implement changes. Always keen to, to learn something. Just getting information from people really, what everybody else is doing going forward. I hope that people will come and view the farm with us, take some ideas that um, some of the things that, that we've already started to implement, um, but also perhaps be able to feel confident to come back and ask us a question. And it's also a great opportunity to feed into the topics that will be discussed at further meetings and also sign up to the discussion group as well in the local area. Good evening everybody um, and welcome to this AHDB webinar. Um, I'm just going to give it a couple of minutes before we, we start our presentations um, just to let everybody uh, join. I hope you've all had a, a good day. Um, it's been nice and sunny here which has made a change. What's it been like down south in you Kim? Oh, it's been lovely but I, I was uh in the car from going from here to Nottingham or just just outside Nottingham which should have taken an hour and took about two and a half because the M69 was closed so the joy oh. the joy of uh, English traffic hey okay? so oh, no. yeah. oh dear, that's not what you want and Mark what's it like across the pond it's uh, very good yeah the, the last few days have been really spring like it's dry sunny and cold but no good for field work yeah it's lovely lovely at the moment yeah really good yeah. And Gillian, you're in the northwest, aren't you? No, West Midlands. Oh, are you? Oh, I don't know. Yeah, South Shropshire. So, yeah, no, it's been lovely here. Like, um, like Kim, we had a frosty start, so it was. I was moving fences on the street this morning, so um, yeah, it wasn't bad. <laughs> it's <was> nice. <laughs> it makes a change, doesn't it? it does yeah, well, it feels it's a bit odd, really. It's not really very seasonal, to be honest, in a way. But um, I know. Hope we don't pay for it in in lam at lambing time. I know. I mean, I did, yeah. I did see on social media that some people had their cows out today. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Same here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it shows what a difference it can make. Okay, so it's it's now four minutes past seven. So I think um, we'll officially start the webinar. Um, so good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Sarah Penrose, and I work in the beef and lamb team at AHDB. So tonight's webinar is the second of three webinars run collaboratively with HDB, with Chagas and also with BSAS. So across all three webinars, we're focusing on um, reducing carbon emissions from livestock production. Often this is quite a confusing topic um, and these webinars really set out to try and help reduce that confusion and just uh, provide some top tips and what we can do on our farms to try and uh, reduce our carbon emissions. So tonight's webinar is focusing on fertiliser management. So that's both inorganic fertiliser and also slurries and farmyard manures. So what can we do to our management practices uh, to help reduce methane emissions? 
The next webinar in the series is on the 21st of February, and that will discuss breeding and genetics. Um, so if you haven't already registered for that, uh, please, please do so and join us then. Um, we also recorded a webinar last week uh, where we discussed grass and forage management. For those of you who didn't manage to tune in, um, I'm now happy to tell you that that is on the YouTube channel, um, so you can uh, watch that again. So the idea of tonight's webinar is it's going to be very conversational. Um, our speakers have relatively short presentations this evening. So hopefully then it gives you plenty of opportunity to ask your questions. Um, and please do make uh, the most of the panelists um, that we have online this evening. To ask a question, um, I'm sure you know this already, but just type your question in um, the question box on the, the toolbar and always remember to, to press send. It's then my job um, to ask the panellists uh, those questions and we will have regular question breaks um, throughout the next hour or so. Okay, so without further ado, it's probably time to introduce our panellists. Um, so Gillian, if I come to you first, would you just be able to introduce yourself? Yeah, so um, Gillian Priest, I'm a senior livestock consultant with ADAS. Um, I live in South Shropshire and um, my husband and I also run our own farm um, business running um, sheep and beef, um, New Zealand Romney ewes and, and ling hill cows. So yeah, I, I balance my time between the two, two roles really. You're a very busy lady. <laughs> well, yeah, if you include the kids as well, then yeah, I'm quite busy. <laughs> I wouldn't have it any other way. No, thank you for joining us. Um, Mark, I'll come to you next. Would you just like to introduce yourself? Okay, good, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Mark Plunkett. I, I work with Chagas. I'm based in Janstown Castle, which is in Wexford in the, the southeast of Ireland. I mainly work in the whole area of soil and plant nutrition. Um, I'm, a, I'm a link between our research staff um, and the advisory staff. So I, I'm, in the, I'm in the specialist core, the specialist team. And I say I, I cover uh, grassland, tillage, nutrient legislation, nutrient advice everything to do with fertilizers and our organic manures for the organization. Brilliant, thank you. And Kim. Yep, hi, I'm Kim Matthews. So I'm, I head the animal breeding and product quality team at AHDB, and I'm also the current president of the British Society of Animal Science, uh, BSAS. And uh, I really, really enjoyed last week's session um, and look forward to this evening's um, building on that, I guess, in terms of forage going into fertilizers. Yeah, so uh, yeah, really looking forward to it. Thanks for joining us tonight, Kim. Okay, so we'll crack on. Um, Gillian is going to present first. So AHDB recently commissioned um, a project to look at nitrogen recommendations for grassland in uh, light of the costly fertiliser, um, in light of costly fertiliser. Um, so Gillian's going to present on that and just tell us really about what is it still cost effective to put in on grassland. So over to you, Gillian. Okay, thanks, Sarah. Um, just try and share my screen, which is hopefully popping up. I can't see it yet, but hopefully it's on its way. Is it coming? Um, not yet. Not yet. Uh, I can see it all right, Sarah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, it must be okay then. We'll go with that. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank so I've you. already done um, a little bit of introducing myself. Um, a, a little bit like Mark, really. I were. Um, I personally am a bit of a link between um, the sort of practical uh, farmer-facing side of the, of the consultancy within ADAS. So I mostly work with um, farmers directly, um, either through funded projects or or paid for by the by the client. Um, but I also get involved in some of the bigger projects that um, the research side of, of ADAS um, get asked to do. So this was, um, as Sarah said, uh, this has come about this evening because, um, because of a research-based project uh, which I got involved in. Um, there's a pressure out there in terms of um, farming, but also the, the whole of industry, uh, us as people, consumers, 
um, to reduce our carbon footprint, whether it's in the home, whether it's at work, um, or whether it's producing food um, as part of our jobs as farmers and in agriculture. Um, and the reason why fertiliser and nitrogen is coming under quite a lot of pressure as a result of that is because um, fertiliser management has a big part to play in reducing the carbon footprint of the food we produce. If you think about um, forage, so silage, 48% um, of the greenhouse gas emissions that come, um, that are produced from that cut of forage are actually from the manufacture and application of, of fertilisers. So if we can manage to produce that forage without fertiliser or with less fertiliser, then that will massively impact on the greenhouse gas emissions from food production on the livestock side. It, um, this um, slide really shows that quite clearly in the sense of the nutrient cycle within our farm businesses. So we've got uh, organic fertilisers, so um, farmyard manure and slurries produced, put back to the land, nutrients in the soil. They then are accessed by the crop, whatever that crop may be, whether it's maize or grass or, or um, wheat then fed back to the animals within the farm business, and that's a, a closed loop a cycle, a natural cycle where nutrients, whilst there are some losses, are predominantly kept within, within the business. And then you've got this, the, the, the fracture on the, on the right hand side, the synthetic fertilizers coming in, and that's where a lot of the greenhouse gas emissions that are coming from food production are sort of entering the cycle. We're also facing a backdrop of massive hikes in fertiliser. Sorry, apologies. The um, fertiliser prices, um, a huge surge in price in sort of late winter, um, based predominantly on the the war in Ukraine and the conflict um, and the consequences of that to energy prices. Um, the reason for saying this is really that it does make financial sense to improve the efficiency of the nitrogen fertilizer that we're using um, and to reduce costs to our businesses. It's not just about carbon emissions. There's, a, there's basically a double, a double benefit really. And as a result of that massive surge in nitrogen price, that's what prompted AHGB to come to ADAS and, and, and actually asked us to do this piece of work, this piece of research, really looking at the impact of those high nitrogen fertilizer prices on nutrient management uh, and whether it whether we got to a point where actually it wasn't cost effective to use. So that's where this piece of work kicked in. The work that we did predominantly started by looking at what the cost effectiveness, the cost benefit of nitrogen is um, in terms of applying to grass. And it's not quite as straightforward as perhaps uh, considering it like a wheat crop where we think about the break even ratio of, of nitrogen application and it's a directly affiliated with yield. It's not quite so simple with grass, partly because we have significantly different grass growth response rates to nitrogen, depending on where your field is and what the climate is. So we, we looked at three different response rates. We looked at a response rate of 30 kilos of dry matter uh, of grass per kilo of nitrogen applied of 20 kilos of dry matter of grass per kilo of nitrogen applied and then a, a lower response rate of 10. So that's what the three lines on the graph are, the blue line being the high response rate, the orange line being the medium response rate and the grey line being the sort of poorer response rate to every kilo of nitrogen being applied. And the, the dotted line across the bottom of that um, graph shows where a cost benefit or break even of, of one. Basically anything above that line of, of one is a means that the grass, the value of the grass that comes out of that application of nitrogen is higher than the cost of applying it. So even when we're getting up to the, the top end of that price per tonne of, of nitram of 750 and 850 pounds a tonne, on the better grass growth classes, we are still getting a cost benefit in terms of response rate to those applications. But on the poorer response rates, um, it's dipping below the line. And that would that would say that you know, it, you know, it really isn't worth applying at those levels. But with all of those lines, you can see that once you get to kind of the, the 450 pounds per tonne, we're starting to get a, a, 
a, a plateauing off of that response rate. Um, so the, obviously the more the nitrogen costs, the less um, production and, and less benefit we're going to get from applying it. The difference in those three lines in terms of grass growth class, you might be thinking, well, what, where do I fall in that? What kind of response rate might I expect on my farm? Um, and this table is taken from um, RB209, which is the Fertilised Recommendations Handbook, um, which is free from AHDB if you want a copy. Uh, but basically it shows how that grass growth is classified. So the very good and good grass growth classes would have a response rate of like 30 kilos of dry matter for every kilo of nitrogen which is applied. And those are the, the higher soil available water soil types, so the, the deep silty soils, the peaty soils, the soils with good ground water, so like river meadows, um, and those areas that have high rainfall in the summer, um, so they would they would generally get a good response rate to nitrogen. Where the grass growth class starts getting down to the poor and very poor is where we've got like sandy soils or gravels or shallow soils that aren't over chalk and where rainfall is um, is limited in the summer growing season. So there are quite a lot of implications if we start thinking about reducing nitrogen um, and a lot of people have um, reduced nitrogen applications to grass. There was a recent, um, I can't remember who did it, but very recently on the Farmers Weekly um, interactive uh, Farmers Weekly podcast, they were talking about the results of a, a survey that was done. And I think something like 78% of people had, had reduced the application rate of nitrogen last year. Um, reducing nitrogen the consequences are that you potentially need to source additional feed or we've got to increase the area of grass available to graze or the livestock numbers um, on the farm or the stocking rate need to be reduced because without that nitrogen application there's a, there's a productivity potentially productivity drop often homegrown forage is cheaper than concentrates of blends um, and brewers grains and and we used a variety of um, in the report we used a variety of cost comparisons um, to look at, you know, if we try and replace grass with bought-in feed, is it cost effective? Well, actually, they, they might cost less if you buy in forage, but you've got to check the quality. Um, and any alternative that you are considering needs to be thought about carefully because nitrogen fertiliser may seem expensive and there are some significant cash flow implications as well to the cost per tonne. But grazed grass is generally still the cheapest feed in most situations on most farms. So it's, it is important to consider whether it's the right thing to apply. But the response, if the response rate is still there and grazed grass is still the cheapest feed, then it may still be worth spending that money. As I mentioned, there are cash flow and working capital implications to all of this. And from a practical point of view, I think really the, the thing that I'm hearing on farm is that the input cost of everything has gone up. So there's, there's, there's higher outlay, there's higher working capital requirement. And yes, the value of stock and the value of, of beef and, and lamb has been higher this year. But all that means is that there's more money tied up in the production of the same thing. And that actually more working capital is needed. And there's also a higher risk factor. So if suddenly the value of the stock falls, um, then actually you've invested so much more into producing that animal um, that as businesses were exposed in, in a way that hasn't been seen perhaps in the past. If um, a business is thinking about reducing nitrogen applications and, and accepting potentially a lower stocking rate, um, if that's the right decision for that business, it is also possible that environmental schemes might offer additional income to compensate for some of that reduced output. There might be options that you can consider that perhaps weren't available before when you were a high fertilizer user. So that's another another factor, whether that's organic conversion or whether it's just low input um, fertilizer options. Do decide to continue using nitrogen and we do decide to spend the money on the, the you know, the more expensive fertilizer, then actually it means that maximizing the utilization of that nitrogen becomes even more important. Um, the more it costs, the more important it is that we utilise every nutrient that we're buying in that bag of fertiliser. So minimising the other growth, other growth limiting factors is critical. And these include things like making sure we haven't got any compaction. So assessing soil structure, 
making sure that we only apply fertilizers when there's only, when there's enough available moisture so last year was a classic example where it didn't matter what you did that grass wasn't going to grow because it just didn't have enough enough moisture in our part of the world certainly testing soil regularly for um, pH for acidity and liming accordingly um, as a result of those soil tests and, and if you need lime that's the most cost effective um, application of, of any anything that you can do on any farm I believe. Um, testing for soil nutrient content so whilst you're doing that soil test for pH you can also test for phosphate, potash and magnesium and making sure that those other key nutrients are in plentiful supply in the soil. If you're in a soil, if you're in a, a cutting situation where you're cutting for silage particularly but, but even some grazing situations um, might benefit from the application of sulfur with nitrogen to ma maximize availability and then also thinking about using a targeted approach so if you are thinking about reducing nitrogen applications make sure you don't necessarily just blanket approach across the whole farm but actually think about where the best fields are which fields are the most responsive thinking about that grass growth class table that we were looking at earlier you know, it's not just the farm that can be designated in different classes there'll be different fields on each farm which will be more responsive there might be fields that have been reseeded that are going to respond better um, than the permanent pasture fields for example and also assessing whether grass is actively growing at the time so either doing that yourself on your own farm using plate meter or just your welly boot and walking across the farm regularly monitoring grass growth um, or using something like the grass check um, the HTB grass check facility where other farms are monitoring those growth rates and you can find a local farm in your area to, to compare yourself to. And then finally sort of have a bit of a go if you're thinking about reducing nitrogen maybe do it on half a field and not the other half and see if it has any, any response. Um, it might be that you're at reasonably high levels and you could actually cut back without significant impact on productivity um, and test different products as well potentially. So I've already mentioned using a targeted approach, but prioritise first cut silages when the grass is generally growing the most actively um, and, and you'll therefore get the best nitrogen response and also those, mo those more productive grazing swords. That was a, a brief run through really of what we can do in the short term to maximise the utilisation of the nitrogen that we're applying, but there are other strategies that we can use um, perhaps implement on a more medium term basis if we're not already doing them um, to reduce the actual application of nitrogen without losing any productivity um, so effectively to replace that source of nitrogen on grass um, there's a lot that can be done with making better use of organic manures and I think Mark's going to touch on some of that in a minute um, so, so I'm not going to go into any more detail on, on that um, and there's a, a lot that can be done in terms of incorporating legumes into grassland both white um, clover red clover and also some of the um, some of the herbal lay mixes have got the ability to to cope with less nitrogen um, I believe that was covered in the the last webinar that Sarah mentioned which has been recorded so if you want more information on that then rather watch that or there's loads and loads of information on on the HDB website about a lot of these a lot of these issues and then finally, another another option in terms of medium term strategy to reduce the nitrogen use on your grass is actually to um, to get more production by implementing rotational grazing systems, which generally speaking will improve productivity by working with um, the natural grass growth cycle without um, changing or uh, altering what you do in terms of nitrogen use. So getting more production from from the same acreage or potentially reducing nitrogen application in uh, by implementing that and again I think that was covered in the last webinar and there's plenty of information out there on the HDB website um, so just in conclusion really to to reduce the carbon emissions um, and also improve business resilience and, and profitability through improved fertilizer management we need to make sure that there are no other limiting factors on on the field in the soil um, in the climate at the time um, before we actually go out with that fertilizer spinner and this is even more important now that it's like applying liquid <laughs> um, use a targeted approach prioritize that first cut growth period and the more productive fields on the farm um, but grass is still the cheapest feed and nitrogen application 
you know, can still be cost effective even at higher rates, uh, sorry, higher price per tonne. Having said that, um, if we can manage to apply less nitrogen, it will reduce carbon emissions um, and also improve that business resilience going forward. And that can be done, as I've just said, by improving the use of organic nitrogen, integrating more legumes and potentially change, changing grazing management systems on the farm. Okay, thank you. That's that's me. Brilliant. Thanks, Gillian. Um, so please remember, if you have got um, any questions, just to um, send those in and I'll make sure I, I read them out and ask Gillian. Um, a copy of the, the full report can be found on the HDB website. Um, obviously, Gillian has just given you a snapshot there. But if you want all the, the nitty gritty details, um, you can find it on the HDB website. Um, thank you very much, Gillian. What, what do you think is going to happen to the fertiliser price? Do you think it will come down or do you think it'll stay where it is? Yeah, well, it's very closely linked to energy. So as we see that that market start to settle, then um, then we should start to see a drop. And I think there has been a small drop at the moment at the start of this season. Mark might might help me with that one. I perhaps didn't know the, the UK prices, but um, it, but in some ways if I'm going to play devil's advocate in some ways the high price has just made people think harder about about using fertilizer and that isn't necessarily always a bad thing um there's certainly been a massive increase in in interest in legumes um and as you, you may know I did a um, red clover um, legume project on sheep because a lot of sheep farmers are wanting to use more clovers and are nervous uh, and including herbal lays and stewardship options etc so um, it's just making some of these kind of key fertilizer management um factors more important they've always been yeah. you know good practice has always been there and none of none of really none of what i've just talked about is particularly new um but it's just it's focusing the mind and making it all the more important because it is so expensive that's it yeah, it's, it's, it's the same over here folks that um it's definitely focused the mind it's put a big focus on things like lime uh, using slurry efficiently like we've seen a big reduction in P and K, especially about a 25% reduction in 2022. Nitrogen, nitrogen is back about 14%, and fertilizer is back about 18% overall. So um, it's def has definitely focused the mind as regards, yeah. you know, how can we use it more efficiently? You know, is there other things that we can do to, um, you know, to increase the supply of nutrients from the soil, for example? Like, that's it. And are more people doing soil tests then? Um, have you seen an uptake in that? Yeah, there has been an increase in soil sampling here. It's increased uh, somewhere in the region of 12, 13 percent. Um, right. You know, in 22 and the same in 21, we've seen an increase. Yeah, soil sampling is very much on the agenda, um, you know, especially when people are cutting back or reducing um, to see what, what are the effects on, on soil fertility and go from there. Like. Yeah, yeah. And Gillian, you mentioned about um, you know, put in fertiliser on, on your best land. What what would you recommend for some of your poor performing pastures? What what can we do there? It depends if they're um, on the sort of radar for being reseeded or whether they are mm -hmm. um, permanent pasture fields. I mean, it, but even in even in permanent pasture fields, you know, there are things like uh, the mob grazing, rotational grazing, resting grass. Um, properly so that you maximize the productivity period and you're not putting all the energy into into short grass growth and then nibbling it off um, so there are still things that can be done and I know the super G permanent grassland project across Europe is, has looked at a variety of um, options with permanent grassland but if it is a, if it's eligible for a reseed and you think it's past the point of sort of sensible production I mean one of the yeah. best investments that you can make is actually to put you know more productive grasses in if, if they're flagging um, or even stitching you know you don't necessarily have to plow to improve fields um, but a lot can be done just with pressured pressure grazing um, yeah and giving decent rest to get rid of some of the sort of poorer grasses and, and let the better grasses um, recover yeah yeah and like you say um, that was covered in um, last week's webinar 
Um, so if grazing management and different uh, forage crops is something that you're interested in, please do go and, and watch that. Um, it's on the uh, Beef and Lamb YouTube channel. Okay, um, so there's no more questions coming in. Um, so Mark, I will hand over to you if that's okay. Okay, that's fine, um, so Sarah. Mark's gonna, lovely. So Mark's gonna talk to us um, about making the most of um, farmyard veneers and, and slurries. Okay, so you can see my full screen, uh, Sarah, yeah? Yes, that's good. Okay, uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I am, I am delighted uh, to be able to talk to you here this evening around uh, reducing carbon emissions through fertilizer management. Um, I say I'm, I'm mainly going to focus around the efficient use of organic manures and fertilizers. So, as as Gillian said, um, you know, the more we can get get out of the the, the nutrients, we we can reduce the application of of chemical fertilizers, and that reduces carbon emissions and also reduces the cost. In terms of fertilizers, um, are, as you know, are, are now very, very expensive, and everything that we can do to, to reduce their their use, um, all, all the better. So, as I say, look, I'm, I'm going to number one. I'm going to focus on organic manures, and again, in Chagas here, we've done a lot of work around the whole area of the efficient use um, of organic manures in terms of application timing method, and how can we get more out of the NP and Cadis in there. Um, for managing it, it, it more efficiently. So again, uh, the the main nutrient that we're trying to retain here is ammonia. Uh, the more ammonia that we can uh, recover or retain during the application, the more nitrogen that we have to grow grass and we can reduce our, our bag or our chemical nitrogen by that amount. So look, it, it very much starts, you know, if you're, if you're to manage the story efficiently, it's like a fertilizer. It's very much important that we know how much nutrient is in it. So again, in, this is, um, table of, of the NPK values of, of uh, cattle slurries at different dry matter. So the cattle slurry that, that we call typical cattle slurry here in Ireland is a 6% dry matter. And there's a kilo of available nitrogen per cubic meter, half a kilo of phosphorus and 3.5 kilos of potassium. And I suppose in old money, that's nine units of nitrogen, five units of P and 32 units of potassium. So it's very, very important to know what's in, in our slurries. Again, they can vary widely depending on where they're coming from on the farm, depending on slurry dry matter, how much water is entering the slurry. So we would encourage um, everybody to, to test their slurry so they know exactly what's in it and then they can use it and apply it at the correct rate and target the parts of the farm where it's going to be used more efficiently. So again, if we look at what's in slurry again in terms of its nutrient profile, you can see in terms of um, nitrogen, there's about 20% uh, nitrogen, phosphorus is about 10% and 70% is um, potassium. So 80% of the nutrients in slurry is P and K. So again, ideally it should go back to where it came from in terms of the silage fields. Um, so again, based on soil analysis and your fertilizer plan, you know, the silage ground tends to be the crop that has the biggest demand uh, you know, during the growing season. And again, to maintain fertility around the farm, it's important that that slurry goes back on um, to the silage ground. And again, it's important to adjust the application rate based on the quality or the dry matter of the slurry also. So in, in terms of um, making best use of the nitrogen in that slurry, so again, how and when do we apply that slurry? So again, um, we're looking at, at low emission. So again, we have different methods of application here. So you can see the splash plate is, 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 is an old, the older method. And again, it's been phased out here in Ireland and we're moving to low emission as in, in terms of our, our band spreader, our trailing shoe, our direct injection. So here in Ireland, it's mainly band spreader and trailing shoe are the two uh, low emission techniques. And again, it's a more precise way of applying slurry. There's no smell, there's no odor. We can apply into heavier covers of grass. We can pick um, better soil conditions. So when to apply it in terms of maximizing the nitrogen? So again, the springtime. So again, you can see here in terms of the splash plate, we get a lot of ammonia loss. Um, you know, from the, the application method. So when we do move to either band spreader or trail and shoe, we reduce the surface area of the slurry and we, we retain more of that nitrogen or we reduce the ammonia loss. So we can go from six units per thousand gallons to nine units per thousand gallons. So we can get an extra three units of nitrogen recovered from that slurry by using a low emission, as in the band spreader or the trailing shoe. The, the other um, 
thing is timing. So again, it, we're trying to get more slurry in the springtime. It's a more efficient time uh, to utilize that nitrogen. So again, um, you know, historically here in Ireland, there would have been a lot of slurry applied in the summer with a splash plate or only recovering three units of that nitrogen. So if we can move to low emission and into spring, we can move from three to nine units per, per thousand gallons. And the big thing here is that we're reducing our ammonia emissions by 60%. So in terms of meet, meeting our national targets, this is the number one technology here in Ireland in terms of reducing ammonia emissions um, and recovering more nitrogen, thus reducing the amount of bag nitrogen we have to purchase. Okay, so what rate? So again, again, it's very much down to uh, slurry quality. So again, I'd be saying to you, the good quality slurries, I can greater than 4%. That should be going to the silage fields. Again, if there is more dilute slurries available, again, they're ideal for the grazing ground in terms of supplying nitrogen and a small amount of P and K. So again, target the slurry to the crops that have the biggest demand, your silage crops, your maize crops. And again, typical application rate there would be 33 cubic meters per hectare or 3,000 gallons per acre. Just a little bit around farmyard manure, there probably is more farmyard manure available on sheep farms. So again, it's a, it's a very valuable source um, of nutrients. You know, it's a, it's a valuable source of carbon, soil organic matter. And again, very good for soil health, soil biology. The form of nitrogen in there tends to be slowly available. Um, and again, typical application rates, anywhere up to 25 tonnes per hectare. And, you know, if you're to look around the farm, again, probably best suited to where, where you're cutting say grass silage, maize, or maybe growing cereals. And it's typical um, nutrient value there. There is 1.4 kilos of nitrogen, 0.6 of a kilo of P, and 5.4 kilos of potassium per, per ton of FOM. Okay. Okay, to move on to fertilizers then. So, so again, it's a, it's, a, it's a big source of greenhouse gases, as, as Gillian was saying, in, in agriculture. And again, if we can use fertilizers more efficiently, we will reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and also we will reduce costs on farm as well. So again, um, you know, fertilizers contribute here in Ireland to about 30% of our, 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 our national greenhouse gases and that's nitrous oxide is the, is, the, is the greenhouse gas, which has 300 times the greenhouse gas power compared to carbon dioxide. So again, I suppose just to bring you back to what Gillian was saying, the importance of soil fertility, you know, getting the lime right, as Gillian said, getting the P's and K's right, um, is very, very important in terms of nitrogen use efficiency. Like for example, from lime alone, um, you know, in, in the graph here, if we have low pH, low P and K, we're getting about a 35% nitrogen use efficiency. And by improving the pH alone, we can go to over 50% nitrogen use efficiency. So when money is tight and especially, you know, NP, NP and K is expensive, you know, very, very important to get the pH right. You know, we talk about a target pH of uh, 6.3 on mineral soils and there's a big, big benefit there in terms of nitrogen efficiency. We're also finding as well that we're reducing uh, nitrous oxide emissions or losses um, by optimizing the soil pH and also optimizing the phosphorus. Uh, we reduce our emissions on, on farm as well. So again, just to maybe bring you back um, in terms of um, in terms of some of the basics, you know, you know, in terms of timing of nitrogen and increasing the efficiency of nitrogen application. So again, if you think of the risky periods, so again, um, you know, we lose about potentially we can lose half of the the the, the nitrogen, you know, in in the, in the three months, say October, November. December and January four months. So again, you know, there's a big risk of nutrient loss this time of the year in terms of leaching, denitrification, and volatilization. So again, timing of that nutrient is very, very important. There's little demand this time of the year. You know, in, even at the minute in February, you know the days are nice, um, but still there's little demand for nitrogen out there in the fields um, as we speak because the growth rates are low, the sunshine levels are low. So again, what we're trying to do is we're trying to put more nutrient into the efficient time of the year. So again, into, you know, from about Paddy's day on, you know, we're putting our slurry out and our fertilizer out, you know, grass growth has taken off, there's longer days, soils are drying out, it's a more efficient time of the year to get maximum benefit from the application of those nutrients. So again, if we look at the, at the, <clears throat> at the grass growth curve, this is information from Pasture Base Ireland, in terms of when we grow grass during the growing season. So you can see anywhere from the end of January up until the first week in April, we grow about a ton of dry matter. 
So that's the production. And our nitrogen is about 30% efficient. So quite inefficient as we speak out there in the fields. As we move in then after Paddy's Day, you know, longer days, we're growing way more grass up until, you know, the 1st of July, somewhere around five and a half tons of dry matter. Now, now these are our big production figures, but we're talking about 14 tons of dry matter. But it's just to give you an idea in terms of when that nutrient is required during the growing season. But more importantly, the nitrogen is very, very efficient. As the days get longer, soil temperatures increase, we're up, up anywhere up to 85, 100% efficiency. So again, this is the window that we want to put that nutrient in. The same as we, we go on, quite efficient as well. And then as you go back into the back end of the year, as I, was, as I was saying there, the efficiency drops off. So again, we're trying to put that nutrient out when it's been utilized most efficiently by the, by the growing grass. Just a few factors in terms of, you know, you know what do we need to use that nitrogen efficiently? The first thing is day length and sunshine. So again, the days are getting longer. Like at the minute we're getting about two hours of sunshine a week. So as we move on, that becomes more and more up to about six hours of sunshine um, per week. And again, that's that's the fuel, that's the energy that drives the, the, the grass growth or drives the system. Soil temperatures, again, we look for a temperature above five and a half degrees. So soil temperatures are actually quite good at the minute here in Ireland, they're between six and eight degrees. Um, and like fields are greening up, but growth rates are quite low as we speak. Field conditions, so again, we've had exceptionally good drying conditions. Field conditions have improved dramatically in the last week. I say there's a lot of activity in terms of, you know, field operations um, going on as we speak. So again, very, very important in terms of using that nutrient efficiently. And also the weekly forecast. So again, look at the forecast. Is there a good week of, of weather ahead? And again, like Gillian has spoke about grass growth rates, we generally talk, you know, you need greater than 10 kilograms of dry matter per hectare per day, you know, in terms of justifying that nitrogen, you know, and again, that will increase, you know, you're talking, I suppose, first, second week of March, those growth rates will start to climb and will increase. Like at the minute, and there's the predicted gross grass growth rates here in Ireland, anywhere between five and eight kilograms of dry matter per hectare per day for for the, for the coming week. Okay, and another big technology that there's been a lot of work done here in Ireland is protected urea. So again, this is urea um, with a urea as inhibitor. And again, uh, it's one of our main technologies in terms of reducing reducing our our, our, our um, natural or our national emissions. So again, switching from can and ammonium based fertilizer to protected urea. So again, the research clearly shows that the inhibitor reduces our emissions uh, quite dramatically compared to unprotected urea. So again, for unprotected urea, we're looking at about a, a 15 to 18% potential loss of the nitrogen. And with the urea as inhibitor, we can reduce that to 3%. So protected urea, it's urea plus an inhibitor. We have two inhibitors here in Ireland. We have straight NBPT and NBPT plus NPP, NPPT. So again, they're coated onto the urea in the fertilizer plants and they're being used here as you know it's replacing can and ammonium based fertilizer and it can be spread right throughout the year both spring and summer and a big attraction at the minute here in ireland is that it's 30 percent cheaper so you know if you, in terms of saving money or reducing costs protected urea can reduce your fertilizer bill by approximately 30 percent so again it's ordinary urea treated with a urea as inhibitor and again it reduces our uh, nitrous oxide emissions by 33% and our ammonia emissions by 20%. And again, protected urea, there's a big yield advantage uh, here in Ireland. We have um, eight years research going on in Johnstown Castle. And again, protected urea is growing about 13% more grass than ordinary urea and about 5% more grass than uh, can and ammonium based fertilizer. So it's a very efficient, very effective form of nitrogen and in effect you can reduce the rate of nitrogen by 13 percent so again another another cost savings there in terms of protected urea just to give sulfur a mention so again uh, this is some work completed by a phd student from johnstown castle uh, looking at the effect of sulfur on grass yield so by adding sulfur to to can we're seeing a 30 percent increase in in tons of grass uh, grown per year also in terms of sulfur uptake so again 
Uh, in terms of timing, we're looking at you know anywhere from March to July uh, peak uptake in April and May. Also, in terms of nitrogen uptake, so again, you know, utilizing that applied nitrogen more efficiently. So you can see there that we can increase nitrogen uptake by 38 kilos and increase our nitrogen efficiency from 39 to 49 percent. And also in terms of nitrate leaching, again, sulfur very very effective. And um, you can see there the cattle slurry treatment with sulfur we can reduce our nitrate leaching from 83 to 33 kilo of kilos of um, per hectare per year. So again, very, very important in terms of reducing nitrate loss to water quality and improving the efficiency of applied nitrogen. So I suppose there's to sum up then, uh, Sarah. So again, technologies uh, in terms of reducing carbon emissions. So again, if we look at slurry, so again, the method and the time of application, we can, in terms of the method, you know, we can, by moving from splash bed to trailing shoe, we can recover another three units per thousand gallons. Also, the timing we apply in spring, another three units per thousand gallons. So we can, you know, get another six units per thousand gallons from our cattle slurry and reduce our bag fertilizer, and um, thus reducing costs, thus reducing carbon emissions. In terms of lime, so again, um, lime is, is is central. Um, in terms of nutrient deficiency, it's low cost, um, and also, you know. It increases the efficiency of the nutrients applied in either chemical fertilizers or organic manures, and it also increases nitrogen efficiency. We can go from you know 35 up to 51 or 2 percent nitrogen efficiency by correcting the pH. And again, it's a low cost. Like lime hasn't increased to the same effect as bag fertilizer has. Also, timing. So again, you know, putting the nitrogen out when the conditions are right. You know what I mean in terms of you know, field conditions, soil temperatures, day length, growth rates. So as I say, at this time of the year, nitrogen is used quite inefficiently. And once we go beyond paddies day, for example, uh, we use that nitrogen quite efficiently because the longer day is increasing soil temperatures, there's a bigger demand for that nitrogen out there in the fields. And also fertilizer type. So again, protected urea is uh, very, very suited here in Ireland in terms of our conditions. Uh, it's a very efficient form of, of nitrogen and um, also it's helping us reduce our greenhouse gas emissions our carbon footprint and also there's a savings there's a savings in the application rate and there's also a savings in terms of the cost per kilo of that nitrogen so with that uh, i'd hand it back to you sarah uh, thank you very much and we we'll take any questions there now thanks very much mark um that was really great lots to certainly lots to think about there um, so our first question, um, how efficient is grass or maize at taking up nitrogen? Has there been any breeding for better nitrogen use efficiency? And that's probably to Mark and to, to Gillian as well. So Mark, if you want to go first. Yeah, I'd say it's, it's very much down to the timing of application conditions. Like, you know what I mean? As, we, as I was saying there, as soil temperatures increase, you know, growth increases, day length increases. You know, you can see there that the the grass uses the nitrogen quite efficiently. We can get up to, you know, anywhere up to 100% efficiency. So again, let's say if you have, you know, the conditions right, you have good pH, you have good levels of P and K, the grass, you know, we can use that nitrogen qu quite efficiently in terms of, of, of growing grass. You know, um, would you be, in, you be in agreement with that, Gillian? I think I think the question is really asking about breeding, so I don't know the answer to that question particularly in terms of grass breeding. But what I would say on that note is that um, the modern grass varieties are incredibly efficient, incredibly high sugar, really, really productive. But the, the issue potentially with them is that any plant that's bred in a in a in a by a plant breeder is bred in perfect conditions. So, you know, if we're going to get the optimum out of these modern grasses, we have to be growing them in perfect conditions. You know, there's, there's got to be no compaction, there's got to be the right pH, there's got to be pink, plentiful supply of other nutrients. Um, otherwise, we're kind of wasting our money and time on, on reseeding. So, you, know, you see fields that are low in um, pH, you see fields that are, have got compaction issues or whatever, the things that thrive are the things that are naturally adapted to that poor environment, which are generally weeds and the poorer grasses, and they will 
resurge even on a reseed they will come back if the if the reseed is done and the conditions aren't aren't right for them like grasses you've spent a lot of money and a lot of time putting in so um yeah. it's really nice saying, efficiency it's, isn't it it's, yeah. it's the issue i think it's about maximizing the growth from the grass that you've spent money the newer breeds yeah as you're saying it's the limiting factor like you know some you know soil testing like like lime you know even timings of, of p's and k's like sulfur like you know we, we're getting we're seeing massive responses to sulfur like you know what i mean we're getting anywhere from you know 10 percent of a yield response on heavy soils up to 45 percent of a yield response on light soils you know so you know i, I suppose yeah. it's a balance a balance of all nutrients and as you say soil quality soil health very very important as well can, yeah. can i ask you something on, on that balance of nutrients question so um i I was listening, I was interested in what you had to say about urea, um, but presumably you need to be careful to use urea only where your P and K requirements, you would, you, you, you'd you use an NPK fertilizer if you need the P and K. Um, Correct. And so, so you would need to, to use urea only where, where that was, it was nitrogen only that you required, I guess. Yeah, that, that that's a fair point, Kim. Um, it's very, very important that that you know you, you have a balance. You have, you know whatever the requirement is in terms of of um, you know peas and k's and sulphur. So like we'd be encouraging farmers to use a blend, some like an eighteen six twelve or you know something along those lines to supply the the phosphorus. You know at the the key times, like you know you get a good response to phosphorus say in March April, um, and also sulphur as well. Um, and I suppose the, the one good thing about dry stock farms, beef and sheep farms, is that there's a low demand for P and K, especially on the grazing ground. You know, it doesn't take much to, to balance that P and K, but you're absolutely right. Um, it, it is important that there's a, a balance, uh, you know, of all the major nutrients there, um, you know, in terms of um, during the, the growing season, absolutely. Yeah. And, and in, in Ireland, Mark, have you seen um, a lot of farmers now using protected urea? Has there been a big uptake in its use? I it has. There has been a, a good uptake there in the last number of years, and I think in the current year, I think with the price of fertilizer is really going to to drive it. That um, it's now thirty percent cheaper. You know, can or ammonium nitrate or nitrate based fertilizers are more expensive. So I'd say you know farmers will use more protected urea, and also there's been more urea put into blends as well. So I'd say definitely in 23, there'll be more urea used here in, in, in Ireland, like, you know. Okay. Dylan, I don't think you have a, a comment on, on using protected urea here. Yeah, I mean, um, it, if you're going to use urea, you really, you know, it must be the protected one because otherwise you're just exchanging one pollutant for another because the, the unprotected urea um, has a huge amount of nitrous oxide emissions. Um, so, you know, it really needs to be protected and it comes down to cost effectiveness of, of parts per kilo of nitrogen. If it's protected urea, then you can compare that, you know, quite favourably with nitrile equivalent. If it's an unprotected product, then it might look really cheap, but actually you lose such a lot of nitrogen, particularly if you haven't got enough moisture or haven't got enough um, grass cover when you actually apply it. So you're sort of kidding yourself, really, if it's an unprotected source um but yeah and then people are looking you know i've got dairy farmers that have never used it before that are, that are considering it this year because of that price implication yeah yeah and just in terms obviously we mentioned um cattle manures and whatnot what about poultry and, and pig manures if people can get hold of it is it is it useful because uh, i know a lot of sheep farms they won't have access to a lot of farmyard manure here I do quite a lot of nutrient management planning um, with farmers in Mid Wales um, through Farming Connect actually and, and a lot of them we start looking at alternative imported manures because they're quite often low in phosphate um, on the farms when we're doing the soil testing and uh, often you know got nearby poultry units where they, they, they can't spread it all at home so they're looking to export so it can work really well particularly um, in a sort of lower intensity beef and sheep system um, what I would say is if you're paying for it, then you need to make sure that you really need all the nutrients and that you apply it at the right time of year, because if you pay for it and spread it when you don't need the nitrogen or when the grass isn't growing, then you're losing a, a really valuable part of that product. Um, and, and just, you know, do the test, make sure you need all the nutrients, but also be careful if you're spreading, um, you need to give a good rest period before you, um, before you graze that 
area <clears throat> because there are potential issues with disease and, and, and things like that. Um, but it's great for silage ground and, um, and good if you can give it enough gap. Yeah, and what about digesting? I know around us there's quite a few um, plants going up and a lot of it on offer, but um, never know how, how good it is really. Yeah, well, I mean, if uh, digest take can vary quite a lot. I mean, there are some standard figures in Hobby 2 and I, poultry and manure is a little bit more consistent, um, but I would definitely recommend a test for, for digest take, you know, um, and you can, you can, te you can test stuff pretty cheaply through labs. The results come back pretty quick. Um, and I'd just be careful with quantity of application because they can be a little bit um, keen to spread as much as they as you'll let them and it i've seen burn off and i've and you know and it can it can leave scorch um or and you do have to be careful if you're putting it on silage particularly if the accuracy of the spreading isn't very good that you can leave areas that are getting too much nitrogen and then you might potentially cut that and put it in your in the silage clamp so um and and affect silage quality so just be careful but yeah test testing it's the best best rep yeah, I, I suppose just on the pig slurry, um, just to add to to Jillian's um, comments, um, the pig slurry is very very suitable for grazing ground. You know, cattle slurry very very suitable for silage ground, but the pig slurry has a very good balance in terms of of, of P is to K. So like even a thousand gallons per acre of good quality pig slurry would probably supply the majority of of P and K, and you know fifteen twenty units of nitrogen per acre, um, in a dry stock situation like so. If you're close to a piggery, you know it's a it's quite a suitable um, nutrient source for for the grazing ground and and the silage ground as well. But more, I, I would see pig sorry more for grazing ground to that P and to the P to K ratio is um, quite well balanced. Like you know, in terms of what's required. Yeah, I mean, I know I've had a lot of farmers ask me recently about well, last year about foliar nitrogen. Do you both have any any thoughts of that? Is is it more cost effective or what, what what do you think? I'll come to you first, Gillian. I'm struggling slightly with that one because I don't have a lot of experience of people using no, it in the livestock yeah. sector. Um, you have to be pretty well set up in terms of mm. um, tanks and, and that side of it. And I, I don't do much arable work, but I know it's the efficiency ratio is is higher, I believe, Mark. You might be able to help me on that one. But um, in terms of and it, and it tends to be applied more little and often and, and so therefore it can hit the growth periods better okay yeah yeah the, the liquid nitrogen it tends to be half and half it, it's half um it's half urea and half uan so you can potentially lose half of the nitrogen if it's spread under the wrong conditions and um, there is some use here in ireland um but again it's from an efficiency point of view it's it's probably quite similar to either urea yeah. you know solid or um can or you know um you know, um, the thing that I like about it is that it's very targeted. It's, you know, it's planted with a, a dribble bar nozzle with a sprayer. So, you know, you, you know, there's, there's nothing going into the headlands or the ditches, you know, it's very precise. That's the thing that I, I like about it. Um, but after that, for me, it's the same, you know, in terms of efficiency, it's the same as solid, a solid fertilizer, you know? Yeah. Okay. Now I know um, I took some farmers on the study talk to Scottish borders and a number of actually livestock farmers were looking at it as a as an alternative and it was yeah it's quite interesting so it's good to get yeah. your thoughts on that um final uh question um because i know we're running out of time does grass height make a difference to nitrogen use efficiency so i know a lot of people after they've got silage will go straight on with the slow rate is that the right time to do it when it's scalped or is it better leaving it to grow a little bit before applying FYM or slurry or whatever they're putting on. I suppose it's I, probably. Um, go on, yeah. Yeah, go on Jillian, yeah. No, I was only going to say that if you're putting, um, if you're putting slurry on, then generally, particularly if you look, if you're looking at using um, a splash plate, you might want to go straight on because you don't get the leaf um, contamination. But my general advice, if you're using the, the training shoes or the, the dribble bar type systems, is you actually want the grass to come back a little bit before you spread, partly so that the equipment parts the grass rather than um, actually coats the new, the new leaf, but also because the grass has then started actively growing again um, and can utilise the nitrogen that you're applying immediately rather than it, you know, potentially applying the nitrogen through slurry and then having a gap before 
Um, that, that's my general advice on the sort, particularly because of this parting of, of new growth. Yeah. Okay. Um, but Mark, in terms of fertiliser, I don't think it makes a lot of difference. But... Right. Mike, do you have anything to add on that? Well, I suppose that's the advantage of the, especially the, the, the trailing shoe, is that it does allow you to spread into heavier covers of grass. And you'd imagine, I suppose, if there was conditions there that were conducive to the loss of nitrogen, say, true volatilization, you'd imagine the cover of grass would, you know, would protect it or would mm. retain more moisture or down there in that. It's like a canopy, you know, a canopy yeah, that stops the wind. Canopy, yeah. micro canopy, like you, you'd, you'd imagine it should be a help in terms of reducing um nitrogen loss or, or volatilization possibly like you know brilliant it also spreads the workload yeah yeah you don't necessarily yeah. want to be jumping on a splash plate spreaders you know the day after you've finished two days of silage harvesting so it yeah. yeah it depends if you get a contractor obviously or you you know it's and it it reduces the the way it increases the window that you can get the contracts to come and do the job as well because you're not all rigging the this contract that's just done your silage to come back and do your um, it's very spreading. I suppose it depends, it how, weeks. depends how much you like sitting on a tractor, Gillian. <laughs> <laughs> how fickle your contractor is. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. So that has taken us up to eight o'clock, and I can't see if there's any more questions coming in. Um, so I will uh, bring the webinar to a close. Um, I'd like to thank all our wonderful panellists for speaking to us this evening. Um, so a big thank you to Gillian, Mark and Kim. Um, it, you've been re it's been, we've covered some really, really good topics and I think there's a lot of um, takeaway messages there. I did land Kim in it at the start of the webinar and asked him to, <laughs> to highlight his um, key takeaway messages. So um, Kim, what have you, you picked up in the last hour? Yeah. Well, I think I think that the top line message for me is do your homework. Know know what what the field requires. Know and know what's in your what you're going to apply. Be that a chemical fertilizer or a, a farmyard manure or a slurry. So uh, actually, you know, know what you need and know what you've got, and then uh, apply it at the right time and uh, in the right place. Um, and then from Gillian. It can still be effective, cost effective to apply nitrogen, mm -hmm. even when it's uh, 750 pounds a ton. And you can, but you can reduce cost and, and carbon emissions by, by reducing the amount you use. And, and there are various ways that uh, you might go about uh, reducing how much you use. Um, and then from Mark, uh, make efficient use of organic manures. Again, doing doing that homework, know what's in it and use the correct application method uh, and know when to apply it in terms of the season and, and the weather. Um, and then, you know, maybe consider protected urea. So lots lots of practical messages there. So thank you both very much. Um, re really yeah. valuable. Yeah, no, thank you. And like I said, um, the full report um, on nitrogen um, efficiency and, and when it's uh, cost effective can be found on the HDD websites. Please, if you want some more detail, do go have a look at that because there's some really good findings in there. Um, so when the webinar ends, you'll be taken um, to, um, you'll be asked to provide some feedback. Please, can I ask that you do that? Um, it's really important we get that so we know um, what we're doing is is meeting your business needs and, and how we can help you, you further as well. Um, so the next webinar is on the 21st of February, covering uh, genetics and breeding and how that can help us reduce our carbon emissions. We also have another webinar on the 20th of February, um, so the night before, you'll be, you'll be fed up of hearing my voice by the end of this. Um, and that's on mastitis in, in sheep, so uh, I, I hope to, to see you all there. Um, don't forget to register for those webinars because even if you can't register and um, watch them live, you can then um, re-watch them uh, after, after the webinars um, being uh, finalised and put on the YouTube channel. Um, so thanks again for listening and thank you to, again to our, our wonderful panel for speaking to us this evening. Thank you and enjoy the rest okay. of your evening. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Paul. Yeah.